Thank okay, you. well, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Chris Humphrey, and welcome to a Wild Action Zoo Zoom. Now, I'm a zoologist, and I own my own private zoo. We've got an 11-acre zoo here, 2,000 animals, which I call my animal family. And we're celebrating NAIDOC week, and we're celebrating all things Indigenous. And we have some of the most incredible native animals on the planet, which live in our very own backyards. And of course, we're all animals. Some of you students are definitely animals. I'm an animal, but we're mammals. And we're endothermic animals. We heat up our body by eating our food, generating heat. Now, we've got lots of creatures here today. And my NAIDOC message to everyone is that we can't just save our favourites and the cute and cuddly creatures. Every animal has a job to do. Every animal is interconnected. Every animal is vital for a healthy planet. And the first creature today, I know some of you have just eaten lunch, but the first creature today is not so cute and cuddly. And we'll get to the cute and cuddly afterwards. But check this out. This is a giant burrowing cockroach. And you might be thinking, why don't you just squish it, Chris? Tread on it. No, these animals are very important, vital for our ecosystems. And this giant burrowing cockroach is a native species. And they don't spread germs. They subterranean living. They live underneath the ground. They come out at night time, nocturnal, and they eat up all of the detritus, all the rotting vegetation. So they munch up the gum leaves in the rainforest, munch, 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 spit it out, and they make the soil and release the nutrients into the ground, helping the rainforest to flourish. Now, cockroaches, unlike you and I, they don't have their skeleton on the inside. Of course, they're an insect. They have their skeleton on the outside of their body an exoskeleton. You've heard this. They have vestigial eyes. Their eyes don't work so well. They can't focus. They can see lightness and darkness, but they use their antennae to feel around their subterranean world. And check out their legs. Now let's go back to our primary school days. If you're an insect, you have six legs, but look at their hairy legs. They don't shave their hairy legs like we do. They use their hairy legs for feeling around their subterranean world. Now cockroaches have three body parts. That's because they're an insect. They have a head, the middle bit called the thorax, and the big fat lunchbox end, the abdomen. And that's where they keep all their fat reserves. They can live for quite a long time without having to eat a meal. This is the largest cockroach in the land. It will grow to the size of my hand and it will live for 20 years. So it makes sense. Every animal has a job to do and we don't want to squish on giant burrowing cockroaches. They live in northern parts of Australia and they keep our tropical savannas and grasslands and rainforests nice and healthy, releasing the nutrients from the rotting vegetation. Interesting. Now the next creature coming out, we have some reptiles to show you. We'll go for a wander in a minute, but I do have to uh, be excused today. Well, the weather's pretty bad. So hopefully the storm doesn't come through. We might have to go inside. Fingers crossed, we'll get away with it. This is the live zoo zoom, anything can happen. But the next creature coming out, he's a shingleback lizard. And this animal lives in Western parts of Victoria. You also find the blue tongue lizard around Melbourne. And I want you to have a good look at him. Can you wave at him for me? That's his tail. This is his head. Ha <laughs> ha. You see, if he pretends he's got two heads, birds won't eat him. You wouldn't eat a two-headed lizard if you're a kookaburra or a magpie. I reckon you might get your beak bitten off. Clever trick. Now, you can tell this one's a male. He's got a big, fat, bulky head. Testosterone. It catches up with him. He can't help it. But check out that big, fat tail. That's where he keeps his fat reserves. It's like a school lunchbox. And these animals estivate. They shut down their metabolism over the summer periods when there's no food around. He can live for three to four months without having to eat a meal. Cool, hey? And I just saw him poking out his tongue. Is he being rude? Is he being cheeky? Uh -uh. He's sensing you. He's smelling the land, hunting for his food. Now, this creature is an omnivore. Omnivorous animals, their garbage guts is they eat everything. They eat fruit, vegetables, and meat, even carrion. Hey, that's a good job. They clean up our arid environments. And he's also got another interesting job. He's like a gardener. He eats up all of the dandelions, all the flowers, all the native flowers in our, in our dry arid areas. And he poops out the flowers as seeds and he spreads seed across our barren landscape. Great job. Now, this lizard, he doesn't have to go to the shops to buy his clothes. His old skin peels off like a dirty old sock. And he makes a new shiny skin underneath. Hey, that's much cheaper than going to Big W. Very clever. Now, short little legs. You can't run very fast with short legs. 
That's my problem. So he's got short legs, can't run. So he likes to camouflage his body sitting still. And look at the big scales on his back. They kind of remind me of solar panels on the roof of our buildings. Big, large scales, they attract the heat. And that's how they heat up their bodies. They sit out into the sun and they heat up their cold blooded or ectothermic bodies to a thermoregulate. That's a problem though, because when they sunbake in the middle of our roads, they often get squished by motorists. So slow down when you're driving around Western parts of Victoria. Don't you reckon they're unique, unusual, interesting job? Remember, we've all got jobs. His job is eating up all the wildflowers and pooping out the seed. Now I'd like to bring out another creature. Now there's five families of lizards in our great land of Australia. He comes a gecko. And for Nadoc week, we're learning about all sorts of creatures. But this gecko, he is nocturnal. Are you guys nocturnal? You're not meant to be, but maybe on a Saturday night, you might be nocturnal. But this creature, he's nocturnal only. And he is a stunner, a leaf-tailed gecko. Now he's actually about 20 years of age. So quite old. And these animals are very cryptic in nature. If they sit still, they kind of look like the bark of the tree which they live on. These animals are arboreal. Arboreal animals live up in trees. But check out his cartilaginous tail. That tail is filled with fat reserves. He can live for a long time without having to eat a meal. But if a kookaburra grabs him on the tail, guess what he does? He drops his tail, runs away, he can regenerate his tail again. And look at the end of his tail. It's got a little bell on the end of it. It's called a caudal lure. And they wriggle their tail around like a fishing lure. That might attract a bug. And then they'll spin around like Pac-Man and grab the bug. Nifty, hey? But curious, look at his big eyes. Nocturnal, but he doesn't close his eyes. Gecko species in Australia don't have eyelids. Unique. So they lick their eyes clean with their tongues. Can you guys do that? I can lick my nose, but I shouldn't brag about that. They don't use a face washer. They lick their eyes clean. So this gecko eats up all the bugs. That's his job. Now geckos change their color depending on how warm they want to be. So when they're cold, they turn dark in color. And when they're hot, they turn a silvery color, pushing away the sun's rays and energy. Now I'd like to put my gecko away, but students just remember, how do they keep their eyes clean? They lick their eyes clean with their tongues. Now, hopefully we're not having a technical hitch. I'd like to bring out a goanna now. Now remember, how many families of lizards are there in Australia? Remember, it's NAIDOC week. We're celebrating all things indigenous. Here comes a lace monitor or a tree goanna. And as you're traveling around Melbourne, look out to Mount Dandenong. There's still a population of this lizard living on the sides of Mount Dandenong. Just bear with me. I've got to duck out of shot. Ah, now this goanna here, he's got a forked tongue or a bifurcated tongue. He can smell you in stereo. And his bifurcated tongue is used for scenting for his prey. He eats venomous snakes. Now he might look scary to you guys, but his job, his ecological niche is eating up all of the snakes. He'd eat a tiger snake or a red belly black snake. And his tough armament on his back, it's like a security mesh. It's like armor plating, like knight's armor. And the the hard skin deflects the snake's fangs. Ingenious. Now, you don't want to get bitten by this goanna. He has necrotic saliva in his mouth. So if you get bitten by him, you could get a nasty infection. But let's check out his adaptations. Very sharp claws for climbing up trees. And look at his tail. If you're a dingo, you think twice about eating a lace monitor with his bullwhip-like tail. Amazing. I'm going to put him away. But remember, he's endangered because of loss of habitat and all the dead old trees in the farmer's paddocks around the Yarra Ranges have been, a lot of them have been cut down. That's where he likes to live. So we need to protect his habitat. Remember, he's got a job to do. What's his job? Eating up all of the slithering snakes. Now, I'd like to bring out one of my oldest friends in the world. And some of you viewers might realize I don't have many friends running a zoo, 2,000 animals, but here comes my oldest friend in the world. I've had him since I was three years of age. And I found him when he was that big, sticking to the boy's urinal in the public toilets in Coffs Harbour when I was a kid. That's too much information, isn't it? But this is a frog, a green tree frog. Google him after my zoo zoom. This frog here, isn't he adorable? And it's a green tree frog. Now this creature, he doesn't go la di da di da or galump galump. This frog loves to go <laughs> And they do that to attract a lady friend. The lad laddie or croak, the more girlfriends he can pick up. Now this frog, he sheds his skin every third day or so. The old skin peels off like a dirty old sock and he doesn't flick his skin in the bin. 
He eats his own skin. Now this frog is an amphibian, not a reptile. They have glandular skin, which they drink through like a, like a sponge. And that's why you mustn't pat a frog with your hand. It can damage their skin. Now, the ecological niche of a frog is eating up all of the bugs. And you get lots of different frog species around Polytechnic. You get lots of frogs along the Merry Creek and you get frogs in your garden. If you have frogs croaking, it means you live in a healthy environment. Oh, one interesting adaptation. Look at his ear. He's got a flap of skin over his ear called a tympanum. And that's a flap of skin like a drum, which stops the water going into his ear canal and big fingers and toes for climbing up trees. Adhesive discs. Interestingly enough, this frog only has four fingers like Bart Simpson. Excuse the rain, by the way. Live zoo zoom. The next creep, we'll keep going because we're tough. Now, the next creature coming out, oh, this is actually good weather for this creature. And you often see these walking across St. George's Road around Northcote and around Brunswick. This is an eastern long-necked turtle. Not a tortoise, I hear you say, because tortoises live on the land and turtles live in the water. They're aquatic. Now, ocean turtles generally have flippers and aquatic river turtles have webbed feet. He doesn't need flippers. But let's check out his adaptations. His nose, it's not on the front of his face, it's on top of his head. So his schnoz is like a snorkel and he can stick his nose out of the water and he can breathe underneath the water. Now, let's have a good look at his morphology. The hard shell, that's his backbone stuck together. Can you guys feel your backbone? Feel it. Some of us don't have a backbone these days. So his backbone is fused together to make his carapace. And underneath, that's called his plastron. His ribs and sternum are stuck together. So no bills, no rent. He's always on the holidays. Now you might be thinking, well, what's the point of a turtle? What's their ecological niche? These guys keep our rivers and waterways clean. They eat up all of the dead fish and they filter it. And basically the water doesn't become deoxygenated. Now I'm gonna put him away, but what is the difference between a turtle and a tortoise? Tortoises live on the land and turtles are aquatic. They live in the water. Books often get it wrong. So, so do some zoos. I shouldn't be cheeky. Now, the next creature coming out, I would like to bring out a mountain pygmy possum. This is critically endangered. And I guarantee no zoo zoom today, anywhere in the world, this is especially for NADOC week, would you see a mountain pygmy possum? I don't mind a bit of rain, I'll keep going. We're tough at Wild Action Zoo. And this is Pugsley, and Pugsley is a mountain pygmy possum. These are critically endangered. There's less than 2,000 left on planet Earth. And here at my zoo, we have 52 individual animals. And we share them with other zoos around Australia. We're very, very, we very keen on saving this animal from extinction. Now, this animal is only found in the mountainous areas 1,300 metres above sea level. And this creature needs our help. Climate change is basically killing this animal off. When there's less snow, this creature basically freezes to death. They use a snow blanket to thermoregulate, to keep warm underneath. Now, this rain's getting ridiculous, but you know what I might do? I'd like to go into our back room so we don't get wet, and we might, follow me, I can talk on the run. Now, mountain piggy possums, they only have four teeth and give birth to four young. The baby mountain piggy possum is called a joey. Now, mountain piggy possums are only found seven square kilometre range around Mount Hoffman, Mount Buller, Mount Cosy Osco. Now, there you go, that's a little bit drier in here. But let's have a good look at his adaptations. Big eyes are seeing at night, big ears for listening for danger, and have a good look at their curly whirly tail. Can you see how they use their tail to grab onto branches with? They use their tail, prehensile tail, to climb up trees, and these animals, they cross pollinate the flowers and they make the seeds. That's their ecological niche. Now, mountain pygmy possums in our lifetime will become extinct. They face other threats as well, like European foxes, cats, and dogs. So please, everyone at home, everyone at Polytechnic today can lock up their cats day and night time because mountain pygmy possums really do need our help. So remember, quick question, how many are left in the wild, we think? Less than 2,000. So we might put this creature away and I'd like to bring out a slithering snake. Would you like to see a snake? Now there's lots of snakes around Melbourne. This is snake season. And it probably wasn't a, a bright thing to do to bring out a snake after a possum. But anyway, snakes love eating possums. They might see my hand is food. Here comes a python snake. Now some of you are thinking, well, the only good snake is a dead snake. That's not true. Snakes are protected for a good reason. They eat up all of the mice and the rats. And when I was a kid, my dad used to kill snakes. But we're smarter than that now and it's illegal to kill a snake. Now this snake 
is a python. It doesn't sting you with its fangs. It wraps around your neck, stops you from breathing, and then goes <coughs> and swallows you whole. That's why I like snakes, because I eat the mice and rats. Mice are the only animal I'm scared of. Now, hopefully it'll stop raining soon. Thunderstorm, who would have thought? Now, look at this snake. This snake is beautiful. This is a large blotched python, or a Simpsons python. And they're found around central parts of Australia. This snake is about 15 years of age. And if you look carefully, you'll see its bifurcated tongue. It's sensing you, smelling. But if you look carefully along its face, you'll see some labial pits, lip pits. This animal hunts you at night time, kind of like Predator of the movie, picking up the infrared that you emit from your warm-blooded mammalian bodies. And this snake lives in places like Alice Springs around caves, comes out at night time and darts out and grabs a bat. This snake can survive on 10 meals a year. That's all it needs to eat. And it can stretch out its skin around its face like us clutching balloon like that. Ingenious, great adaptation. This snake doesn't have a six pack when you're working out at the gym. This snake has a 220 pack arboreal tree climbing. I'd like to bring out another creature and I'd like to bring out a black headed python. These snakes are my favorite. I have 200 pet snakes at my zoo. I never get burgled. And this black headed python coming out now also asphyxiated prey, but it lacks those heat pits along its face. It's got one here on its chin, but this snake loves eating reptiles. Look at this snake. This snake is Casper. And guys, I think she is drop dead gorgeous. She's got some interesting characteristics though. The black head helps her to heat up quickly in the sunshine. It looks like it's had its head dipped in a black inkwell. The black head helps her to heat up quickly, thermoregulate. But why wouldn't she be black all over? She lives in tropical northern parts of Australia. If she was black all over, she'd get too hot. And remember, snakes don't sweat. They don't have to wear deodorant, but if they don't sweat, they can't cool down quickly. And she would die if she got too hot. Now this snake employs flicker fusion, lots of stripes down her body. If she moves quickly, predators can't get a migraine if they're trying to hunt her down. Beautiful creatures. I know a lot of you don't like snakes, but we're celebrating NAIDOC week. We're celebrating all things indigenous and what a beautiful creature. I'd like to bring out the next creature now and I would like to bring out a an owl. Now, I love learning about animals that live in our own back gardens. I love protecting biodiversity. Remember, every animal has a job to do. And this is an owl, a raptor. It's Australia's smallest type of masked owl. It's got a, a big round face like a radar dish. It's a white bodied owl and it's called a barn owl. It's got claws, it's called talons. It's a raptor. And this one's called Aussie. You get these in the middle of Melbourne. Come out at night time, of course, but sadly they get struck by cars at night. Can you see her face? Now, she's got a beautiful round face, so picking up sound, but her left ear is lower than her right ear. It's asymmetric. So when she's doing this with her head, she's not doing a boogie woogie or listening to doof doof music. She's three dimensionally listening. She's getting sound from two different sources. Now, this owl can't move her eyes in her orbital sockets. So, she can spin her head around 270 degrees. That is incredible. It's kind of like Exorcist the movie. Don't watch that one, you'll have nightmares. But beautiful creature. We need owls around Melbourne and around Polytechnic. Wouldn't it be great if we could put up some nesting boxes for owls to lay their eggs in and to raise a family and we wouldn't have any problems with mice and rats. Now that's an issue too, because people use rodenticides, you know, like rat sack from Bunnings, and that sadly rats and mice die, the poor old owls eat the sick and dying rats and mice and they die as well. So we've got to be careful how we control our rodents and clean up our back gardens. Now, I might put my beautiful owl away, but remember, how many degrees can they spin their head around? That's right, 270 degrees. And I would like to bring out another creature, which people get confused with an owl. It's a tawny frog mouth. Now this creature lives in everyone's back gardens around leafier parts of Melbourne. But the biggest threat this time of year is breeding season and tawny frog mouths, they lay two eggs usually, but the eggs of the chicks often fall out of the trees and they're easy prey to cats and dogs. Now this is Hawkeye and this little chick here is four weeks old. Now everyone calls them an owl, but they're not an owl. They don't have talents and they use these little sensory feathers on the tip of their beak to pick up a moth or an insect on the wing. They often sit around or roost on our street lamps and that's where all the bugs are attracted to. Now remember, it's not an owl. Next time someone says tawny frog mouth owl, they're incorrect. 
These animals belong to the order Carpromolgiformes, which means goat sucker. And they're more related to oil birds and night jars. Aren't they adorable? So listen, it's NAIDOC week. We've got a responsibility to protect all things Australian. Please lock up your pets and don't let your cats run around daytime or nighttime. They don't belong in our natural environment. And listen, I love cats, I really do. Russian blues, beautiful animals, but don't let cats wander around our native natural environment. Now, I might put my 20 frog mouth away. How's the rain going out there, team? Not very good? Would you like to see a kangaroo? Haha, <laughs> it is NADOC week. The quintessential Aussie animal eats a kangaroo. It's part of our emblem. And this kangaroo here, well, it's kind of like a 40 year old male that hasn't left home yet and sitting on the couch and watching TV. He's in his sleeping bag at the moment. He's big. His name is Popeye because he's got big muscles. And Popeye here, I've got a team behind me helping me out. Popeye here, woo -wee, he's a bit of a stinker, but he's a macropod. And isn't it amazing that we still find kangaroos around the suburbs of Melbourne? When I was a kid, there weren't many kangaroos around. But no one hunts kangaroos anymore around Melbourne. And there's plenty of grassy areas for them to feed, lots of water and irrigation. So kangaroos have proliferated in numbers in some places. But sadly, when they proliferate in numbers and increase their mob numbers, sadly, they can't radiate out. They're trapped in by freeway fences and suburbia and people think they're abundant, but they're not. They've got nowhere else to live. Now, let's have a good look at his adaptations. Big ears for listening for danger, and big eyes for seeing at night time. But have a good look at these big clod hopping feet. Big feet for bounding around the Melbourne landscape. But he's also got this huge big tail. Look at that tail. The tail's used for balance. Now, kangaroos, as they're hopping about, they use five points of their body. That's called pentapedal locomotion. I'll get you to spell pentapedal afterwards. So kangaroos, what's their job? What's their importance? They eat up all of the grass. In the grass are grass seeds and they poop out the seed across our landscape. Hey, one interesting fact, have a good look at his claw on his toe. That's called a syndactyl claw and they use their split claw like a grooming brush, like a hairbrush. Maybe I should try one of those as well with my hair. Now, I'd like to put my beautiful kangaroo away, but remember, they're a marsupial. They have a pouch. They have a very short gestation period. Slow down dusk and dawn around Melbourne and don't hit our kangaroos. Now, for NAIDOC week, we have another special guest. Here comes a grey-headed -headed flying fox. It's been a long day. And this grey-headed flying fox lives around Melbourne. You might even have one of these in your garden. Now, Gizmo here is the largest bat in the land in Australia. This is called a mega bat, and she's a frugivore, frugivorous. She loves eating fruit and pollen. Now, that's part of their ecological niche. As they're fossicking around the nectar and pollen and fruit, they cross-pollinate the flowers and the trees, and they make the seeds. So these are a keystone species, a very important animal to protect. They're listed as vulnerable because they're basically a refugee in Melbourne. They never used to live in Melbourne. But about 30 years ago, 40 years ago, they moved down the east coast of Australia to find new habitat because people took their habitat away. So let's all learn to live with grey-headed flying foxes. They live in our gardens at night time. They eat up our fruit. They make a squabble. They might wee everywhere, but they were here first. And I think they are drop-dead gorgeous. They remind me of a flying chihuahua. Sorry, it's just attacking my camera person here. Never mind. Never work with animals and children. I do both. But have a good look. Look at its wing. Can you see the wing? The wing is actually the hand of a bat. Now, some people say patagium, but it's actually patagium, a flap of skin over their hand, which helps them to fly. The flap of skin's attached to their wrist, to their ankle. And these beautiful bats fly 200 kilometers a night from Melbourne to Bendigo, dropping seed across our landscape. Interesting fact, gray-headed flying foxes when they get head lice, it's all fessed up, we've all had head lice. What they do is they hang upside down, they urinate on their bodies, and that burns off all the ectoparasites. So, hey, no need to go to chemist's warehouse for one of those fancy shampoos. So grey-headed flying fox, what's their job? They pollinate the flowers, making the seeds, and they poop out the fruits and the seeds across our landscape. I think they are drop-dead gorgeous. Now, I have another creature coming out. Another creature which is found in Melbourne, it's a sugar glider, also has a patagium. And this sugar glider here, this little gliding possum, lives along the Yarra River in Melbourne. A population was just discovered around Kew, around the wetlands and in the billabongs. Now, this little gliding possum, look at it. 
Look, it's a gorgeous creature. It's a marsupial and it has a flap of skin underneath its wings and arms and attached to its ankle. It can glide 50 meters in one leap. Now, big ears for listening for danger and also insects. And these little possums have very sharp incisors. They're chewing into the bark to suck up all of the, the exudates, all the sap. Now, also has a long tail. They use it like a boat's rudder for steering as they glide. Now, students, let's consider this beautiful possum living in Melbourne. They're becoming rarer and rarer and rarer. They don't have a lot of habitat to live in. They need the hollows and the old trees to raise a family in and rest in the daytime. And they also, these creatures also are predated upon by cats. So please lock up your cats. It's common sense really, isn't it? So I'm gonna put my little gliding possum away. A sugar glider, how far can they leap? Up to 50 meters. Very well done. We're gonna get outside in a minute. The rain's dissipating. But I've got another creature quickly to show you because I know we're all from around Melbourne and today we're focusing on some Melbourne animals and this is a wood duck. Now, people see these all the time, but they don't know what they are. And the adults have the brown heads. And this beautiful little duckling, it hatched in my hands from an egg a few weeks ago. And this little duckling here, it's a herbivore. And that's their environmental niche. They eat up all the grasses and they poop out the seed. Sadly, this time of year, that's when the wood duck families are walking across the roads and they get run over by our vehicles. You'd have these all around polytechnic in our agricultural areas along the grass. So keep an eye out for them. And listen, do me a favour, next time you're walking through a park or a paddock or through the forest, can you do me a favour and walk your dog on a lead? Because your dog, even though it's friendly and well-trained, it would love to eat a baby wood duck. These animals are protected species and they lay their eggs up in a tree in a hollow. I'd like to bring out a crocodile now. Now, there's no other quintessential Australian reptile than a crocodile. And let's think about crocodiles in their ecological niche. They eat the sick and the dying. They're the top of the food chain. And this creature here, oh, this is a freshwater crocodile. We do have large saltwater crocodiles today. A bit hard to manage for a zuzu. And I know what you're thinking. You're going, Chris, you've got a bandage around his mouth. Isn't that cruel or mean? Uh-uh. Isometri isometrically, I need a copy. Isometrically, they're very weak at opening their mouths. They've evolved to close their mouths. Now, they have a PSI or jaw strength of 3,200 PSI. Very, very powerful PSI, jaw strength. And have a good look at their dentition. Their teeth crisscross over. So they've got 66 sharp teeth in their mouth. And when their teeth fall out, they grow them back again and again and again and again. Now we have 20 teeth as kids, milk teeth, and 32 adult teeth. They have 66 sharp teeth. And have a good look at its nares, its nostrils on the tip of its schnoz. So they're well evolved or adapted for swimming and being aquatic reptiles. The nose like a snorkel. And can you see its webbed feet it's got? Webbed feet for swimming like flippers. Now, another interesting adaptation. Look at the design of their tail. They are called scoop scales and they stick their tail out into the sun, kind of like solar panels, highly vascularized. What an amazing creature. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Crocodiles have three eyelids. The third eyelid, it's called a nictitating membrane. They use their third eyelid like a pair of windscreen wipers inside their eye. And Moriarty here is not opening its eyes at the moment. I, I think a bit camera shy, but um, she will open her eyes in a minute. Never work with animals and children. I do both. Now, I might put my crocodile away because I think it's time to show you a penguin. Would you like to see a penguin? There's no other zoo zoom in the world today to celebrate NAIDOC week where you can see a live penguin. Do you know in Australia, we have a penguin that lives on mainland Australia in temperate areas. You find penguins living in the middle of Melbourne at St Kilda Marina. Now, depending on which books you read and which university you go to, there's 16 to 17 different species of penguins worldwide. Now, the little penguin, or fairy penguin, I still call them fairy penguins. Oh, it's nice to be outside, not even raining. Fairy penguins, or blue penguins, are blue on the back, so predators can't see them from above, and white underneath, so seals and sharks can't see them underneath, beneath. Now, these beautiful penguins at the moment are laying eggs. It's penguin breeding season, and that makes them vulnerable to attack when they're laying their eggs on land. They get eaten by foxes and pet cats and dogs. So do the right thing and be a responsible pet owner. Now, this penguin coming out now, this is a beautiful little penguin. No bands, we call him. And he's a proud dad of a little chick as we speak. I'm hand-rearing a baby penguin in my lounge room. But have a good look at his adaptations. 
wings not for flying, wings for swimming, propelling himself through the water. And his scientific name is Eudiptila minor, which means great little diver. And they have a very dense coating of feathers all over their body, kind of like a wetsuit, to insulate their bodies in the cold Southern Ocean. Hey, interesting fact, penguins can live on land, but they can raft up and swim out in the ocean, in the Southern Ocean for up to four months, hunting for fish, to fatten up their bodies so they're nice and healthy, to lay smallest penguin in the world, 16 to 17 different species, and the only blue penguin. And they live right in the heart of Melbourne. Now, I'd like to bring out another indigenous creature, which we'd all be familiar with. It doesn't like to bark. It likes to <laughs> a howling dingo. Now, this is Australia's quintessential wolf, I like to call it, not a dog. They only breed once a year. Less of an impact on our native environment. And dingoes, well, they don't smell like a dog. You know how they have a wet, smelly doggy smell? Dingoes don't smell at all. And this is Simba. And Simba is, hello Simba. You can smell all the animals on there. Simba, I'll turn his head around. Oh, come on, look at the camera. Come on, Simba. come over here. Oh. Now Simba here, isn't he gorgeous? Now Simba is a male dingo. He was hand reared in my house. He slept in my bed from a three week old pup. Now Simba is the most common phenotype of a dingo. They're don't go to sleep on me. He's a tan dingo. You also find black and tan dingoes and white dingoes as well. Now, dingoes are persecuted animals in Australia. They've been hunted to extinction in many parts of the country because, well, they do eat some of our livestock, but they were here first and we need to protect them. They're so important to control feral animals like foxes and cats. They may have displaced the thylacine and the Tasmanian devil, but they're here to stay. Oh, that rain, it won't go away. So remember, dingoes, they don't bark, they and you still find purebred dingoes in Victoria, around the back of the Yarra Ranges and up around Big River. Now I'm gonna put him away and I'd like to bring out, before it rains too heavily, can I bring out some cassowaries? Now, isn't it cool watching a zoo zoom where we're getting soaking wet and you're at home in, your, uh, in front of your laptop watching this. It's a 24 seven job looking after all of these creatures. We have many critically endangered animals that we care for. Now, I breed a lot of these creatures and I share them with other like-minded institutions all around the country. I'm all about conservation and education and teaching people why we need to protect the environment. Because after all, we've only got one environment and we haven't done a very good job. This next creature coming out now, it's actually not coming out, it's actually the world's most dangerous bird. There's only 900 left in Australia. We think it's the Southern Cassowary, a giant bird. In fact, it's the third largest bird in the world. Does anyone know what the largest bird is? Oh, very good, an ostrich. I'll give you a job. What's the second largest bird? Now it goes on height, not on weight. It's the emu. Castaways can eat up to 20 kilograms of fruit in a day. And that's what we feed them. They eat a bit of protein, maybe a dead rat or a dead chicken, but they love eating fruit and that's their job they eat up all the fruit in the rainforest they poop out the seeds and they spread seed across our landscape i'll have to do my hair later on get a blow dryer out what do you think now do you want to see a cassowary eat now when you do see them eat have a good look at their big horn on their head it's called a cask and they use that to cut through the rainforest and all the lawyer vine like a machete and they've got a double wattle a big floppy bit of skin underneath their chin it's like an adornment it's um, basically makes them attractive to the opposite gender and a big talon on their toe for disembowering their prey. It's like a dagger, like a velociraptor. Let's excuse the rain. Now, it has been one of those years, hasn't it? Now, these cassowaries, just come with me students. These cassowaries here, have a good look at them. These are native Australian animals. They live in our rainforest in far Northern Queensland. We have four cassowaries that reside at our zoo. And you might notice the one on the left, she's missing an eye. She came from another wildlife park many moons ago. And unfortunately she had to have her eye removed. She got a nasty infection. They're very healthy. It's our dream to breed these in the next year or two. Now you see me, now you don't. Look at all that fruit go down. They eat better than I do. Fruit salad, yummy, yummy. Now you get very dirty, very messy doing this job, being a zookeeper. Perhaps some of you guys might like to come up to our zoo one of these days and do a zookeeper program. Now I'd like to get somewhere dry and we might actually, yeah, it's not getting too wet. You guys okay back there, not getting too wet and cold? Because we live on the side of a mountain. 
It's a place called Macedon, Mount Macedon. It's about 70 kilometers north of Melbourne. And we have weather extremes here. So you have to take that into account when you're looking after all of these creatures. It's like running a hotel 24 seven. You never get a break, never get a holiday, but it's very rewarding. Now it is NAIDOC week and I've got the quintessential Aussie animal to show you. Now we're seeing a kangaroo. I'd like to show you a koala. Now koalas, koalas, think about it. They're not a bear, they're a marsupial, have a very short gestation period of about 35 days approximately. And excuse the darkness, no one comes behind the scenes. So you guys are very lucky today. Now I've been out and about today. We're coming to the, I've been out and about this morning picking lots of fresh yummy gum leaves. Now, this koala coming over to me now, his name is Banjo. Now, boy koalas like to make a sound like this. They make that sound, basically say, hey, look at me. This is my territory. And uh, basically back off, don't come anywhere close to my girlfriends and eat my gum leaves. Now, this is Frankie. And Frankie here is a big boy. And you can tell he's a boy. He's got a big fat boofy head and a big schnoz, a big nose. Can you see that? He's got a nose like mine. And it's interesting, as we stand here in the pouring rain, well, look at how the water repels off their furry coast. It's like, a, it's like a nice furry jacket or a duffel coat. I used to have one in the 70s. But look at the claws, big claws for climbing up trees. You know, the koalas, they used to be abundant when I was a kid. But sadly, koalas are disappearing through loss of habitat, diseases, dog attack, and car strike. We, and bushfires too. The last bushfires last summer took out half the population on Kangaroo Island. So we think there's less than 80,000 koalas left countrywide, nationally. And koalas, they only live here in Australia. So we all have a very important job to do. Now koalas, they eat gum leaves for breakfast, lunch, and tea. Now if you eat koala gum leaves, you get sick and die. They're full of toxins. The koalas have got a nifty adaptation. Guess what they do? They eat their mother's poo at seven months of age that inoculates their guts so they can eat toxic fare, toxic poo. Now, a kilogram of gum leaves a day. That's a lot of gum leaves we have to collect. You are beautiful. Can I quickly show you that? You can also tell as a boy, he's got a sternal gland on his chest. Can you see the sternal gland just here? They rub, they smear their koala BO all over the branches where they live. You can also tell he's a boy too, can't you? He's quite well endowed. Now, what can we do to save koalas? We need to slow down in our cars, dusk and dawn. We need to control our pets, walk your dogs on a leash. Control your cats, because a cat, believe it or not, would eat a joey koala. And we also need to connect up existing habitats. Now, do you know that a koala was found the other day at Fitzsimmons Lane in Templestowe, in the middle of Melbourne? So that's positive news, it's not all doom and gloom. Now, every day I have to collect koala poo. We might have a bit of koala poo there, Lily. Koala poo, it's very interesting. It tells you about their health. You break it open and you check that they're chewing their food properly. I had to eat some of this for a TV documentary I did. It wasn't that bad, it tasted like Mentos. But this koala poo, if I open it out, there you go. Can you see all the fibrousy bits in there? The little tiny bits of leaves? That shows that their teeth aren't wearing down. If their teeth are wearing down, they can't get all the nutrition out of the food that which they're eating and they can surely die. They lose weight. Doesn't smell bad at all. 200 times a day, they poop. That's a very regular koala. And do you know that koalas have fingerprints like human beings? Does anyone know the closest cousin to a koala? It's the wombat. Very good. I'll give you all jobs. Hey, just quickly, I've got a team of people behind me and they're just rolling their eyes at the moment. It is raining and everyone's wet. But I want to show you something really cool. Remember the tawny frogmouth, the chick I showed you before, the bird? These tawny frogmouths have just laid some eggs. And I really want to show you. There's no OH and SE. If I fall over, don't laugh. But these tawny frogmouths have just laid two eggs. Now, I want you to think about tawny frogmouths, where you live. It's breeding season. It takes about 28 days for them to hatch. But this is Gonzo. And Gonzo here has got two little eggs. Can you see them there? Wow. That is so cool and big eyes and a wide gaping gob for scaring off predators. Now, we're in the male area where we keep our koalas. We've got eight koalas here at Wild Action Zoo and I'd like to show you a little baby boy. His name is Banjo. He's with his mum and his auntie because he's too small to be kept with all the big boys. You see, boys like to bellow. And remember, at night time, they make this sound. <laughs> 
Sounds like a didgeridoo, doesn't it? Great for Nadoff week. Now, koalas are found right up the east coast of Australia. But sadly, they are disappearing. Now, no one gets to come into this enclosure. And in this enclosure, we actually have an echidna and also a ringtail possum. Now, in Australia, there's three animals which like to eat gum leaves. So breakfast, lunch, and tea. Ringtail possums, greater gliders, and koalas. And this is Banjo. Isn't he a sight for sore eyes? And look at his fat tummy. He's not overweight. He's got about a kilogram of gum leaves in his gut. He's got a Buddha belly. Can you see that? That is a face to die for. And remember, koalas, they've got two thumbs, but can you see those, the wolves, the fingerprints on their hands? Very well adapted for climbing. Now, the next creature coming out, I would like to bring out a ringtail possum. And this creature here, a little my zoom images in the background, this is another creature which eats gum leaves. Or hopefully that rain isn't too distracting. But this little possum lives right around Melbourne. These creatures need our help. In the daytime, they sleep in a dray, a possum dray. At nighttime, they come out at nighttime, but the biggest threat to them are pet cats. So please, lock up your cats. But have a good look at the adaptations. A curly, whirly tail, I mean photobomb, a curly, whirly tail for grabbing onto the branches with. Now, the scientific name of a ringtail possum is Pseudochirus perigrinus. And Pseudochirus meaning false hand, and perigrinus meaning pilgrim or alien. I reckon they look like they've got alien eyes. E.T. Bonhomme. So, don't you think it's incredible what lives around Melbourne? All of these creatures which we need to protect. Now, the next creature, this creature here, is a short beaked echidna. And his name is Boris. And Boris here, you can tell he's my son. He's got the same hairdo, don't you think? There is some resemblance. Now, what's so famous about an echidna and a platypus? They're a mammal, but they lay an egg, an egg-laying mammal called a monotreme. Now, echidnas have got some nifty adaptations. They have an 18 centimetre long tongue for <laughs> slurping up their prey. They can even move their tongue sideways. Now, echidnas, when they lay an egg, it only takes 10 days to hatch. That's a very short incubation. And we've just discovered that echidnas are ingenious at escaping the heat from bushfires. They dig down directly beneath themselves and they get down about a metre and they can avoid the, the heat from the flames. Now, echidna spines, they're not venomous. They're made out of keratin like your fingernails. Did you know that echidnas are the most widely distributed mammal in Australia? The native mammal, they're found in Tasmania, they're found in the Kimberleys, they're found throughout Australia in all different environments. But the biggest threat to them is loss of habit habitat, especially when we do forestry practices, when we grind down the stumps, echidnas often get munched up and are destroyed. Now, echidnas are home to the largest flea in the world called the echidna flea. And you might notice he's got a bit of a wet snotty schnoz He's not sick. He uses his wet snout for smelling and picking up the, the prey that he's trying to hunt. You get echidnas in Melbourne, but they're becoming rarer and rarer and rarer. Now, students, it's very hard to multitask in the rain, but I've got one more creature I would like to introduce you to. It's called a laughing kookaburra. And then we might have some questions from you guys back at home, back in the classroom. This kookaburra coming out, all of my team with blonde hair have run off. He doesn't like girls, okay? He's a bit of a stubborn kookaburra. He hatched in my hand from an egg. So he thinks that I'm his dad. And when he laughs today, he's actually not telling you a bad joke. He's telling you to back off, stay out of my habitat and don't steal my food. Now, hopefully he'll laugh and hopefully he'll get rid of the noise and the rain. Now, this kookaburra is the largest kingfisher in the land. Now he's adapted for dry environments. So he doesn't just eat fish, he'll eat snakes as well. Are you ready? <laughs> Look at his big beak he's got for grabbing snakes with. That's his ecological niche. So we need to protect kookaburras. Kookaburras do such a great job for us. The biggest threat to them though is loss of habitat. They need a place to lay their eggs. Hey, wouldn't it be a good idea? We all go home this weekend, maybe go on to the La Trobe University website and download a plan for a kookaburra nest box. 
One more time. Are you ready? Tell he's a boy. He's got blue wings and a blue backside. And girl kookaburras think that's pretty hot stuff. Now, students, I hope you've enjoyed today. I'm sorry about the rain. We're in the middle of a thunderstorm. It's monsoonal here today. But uh, I'm not making it up to the raindrops. But, Arne, I think it's over to you. Students, I hope you had a great day. I hope, hopefully you're celebrating NAIDOC week. I think we live in the best country in the world. And it's all of our jobs to protect native animals. They all have a job to do. I'll see you next time. Can't wait for some of those questions.